tonight, we welcome Christine Buhl, Oregon Department of Forestry Forest Health Program Entomologist for our June Science Pub entitled, What the Heck is Dendroctinus? In this presentation, you will learn all that you ever wanted to know and more about urban and forest tree health as it pertains to insects, how to diagnose attacks from our more prominent pests, invasive insects to be on the lookout for, and the benefits of forest insects. This presentation will answer questions like, why is my tree dying? What are those holes or globs of sap from? What's eating those leaves? What good are insects to trees anyway? And most importantly, what can I do to protect my individual urban tree or forested stand from insect damage? And Christine obtained a Bachelor of Sciences from Envir in Environmental Science with a specialization in and minor in entomology from OSU and a PhD in entomology from UW-Madison. Madison's my hometown. <laughs> um, she has a broad background in entomology, which has led to various projects concerning fire and biocontrol along the Texas-Mexico border, insect food sources for endangered Hawaiian finches, public health for anthropod-borne illnesses and chemical defense ecology of genetically modified biomass crops. She currently lives, um, serves as the state forest entomologist with the Oregon Department of Forestry, where she provides entomological si er, technical assistance to various types of landowners and flies aerial surveys of forest damage. When not talking bugs, she is an outdoors and fitness enthusiast, hamburger snob, and connoisseur of uh, fine yeast fermented malt beverages flavored with <laughs> <laughs> And with that, we welcome Christine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. Although listening to the outcome of the trivia, job security is at stake. You guys did too good. You rocked it. That scares me a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so as is mentioned, um, I'm a very broad spectrum entomologist. I'm currently serving as the state forest entomologist working with Oregon Department of Forestry, but I've worked in a lot of different fields in entomology because insects are everywhere. They are in every environment. They fill a lot of niches. They're really important. So the two things I really want to get across tonight is one, an appreciation for insects and a respect for them as part of our ecosystem when it's functioning naturally and healthy we have insects. Having insects is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. There are certain situations, a lot of times human aided, in which situations create an environment where insects can outbreak and then they're a bad thing. And that's where I come in because everybody calls me when they have something that they don't want in their yard. So I'm gonna try and point out some of the things that maybe you might run into and I'm gonna try and highlight the ones that are pests, but also let you know about ones that are not pests, that are part of our functioning ecosystem that we actually want around. So first, we're about to get nerdy. Um, insects are my favorite thing. So I really hope to share this with you, that you'll get excited about them, maybe not as excited to steal my job. I'd be very sad about that. But um, insects are a beautiful, diverse array of animals that we have that if you just take a little bit of a closer look, you can see that their bodies and their habits make them perfectly suited to the niche that they feel or fill, that they are perfectly suited to fit in a lot of different environments, serve a lot of different purposes. It's truly amazing to see where they are. So um, they have a lot of um, evolutionary advantages that make them the way that they are. That they can be in a lot of different places. They can either be very specialist or generalist. Um, among these, small body size. If you're small, it's easy to hide and not hard to get a lot of food to be full, right? So that's a really big one. Unfortunately, they do have a large surface area to volume ratio, which means they dry out really quickly, but they have this thing called chitin. So we have vertebrae, we have a backbone. They do not, they have this exoskeleton, and I think of it as like their M&Ms, that they have this nice crunchy shell and a little bit softer inside. So this is a nice body armor that reduces moisture loss, it provides them protection, sometimes it's even protection from heat and other extremes. Um, so that's really helpful. Some of them have really quick development, as I'm sure you've noticed with box elder bugs that are covering your screens right now. 
um, and prolific generation. So this is where we get weird. So there are some insects that have what's called telescoping generations in which the mother is pregnant with her next generation, which is pregnant with the next generation. It's creepy, I know. Um, you can see where sci-fi has drawn from a lot of these weird insect things. Um, some of them have flight, and I say some of them because not all insects have wings. In fact, some of the females don't have wings to their male counterparts. So there's a lot of variations with insects. They don't like to be put in a box. They definitely um, do a lot of different things. Um, different breathing strategies, so insects can live in the water, insects can live at high elevations. Um, they have a lot of different mechanisms to cope with the different environments that they live in. Temperature management strategies, again, that chitin comes in really help handily, um, but they also have other strategies to help them live in cold temperatures and warm temperatures. I was just in Yellowstone. I saw midge larvae living in the hot springs. Some of those reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit and over. Those midge larvae are doing just fine. Um, there are stonefly um, and fly larvae that have been found in below freezing water, um, which, you know, it's frozen, and they can be rehydrated. It's they're found in a lot of different places. Butterflies have been found in the Arctic Circle. These are really tough creatures. Um, and we have specialists and generalist evolutionary strategies in terms of pollination and what they eat. Some of them only eat one plant or lay their eggs on one plant. Some of them can reach a broad range of plants depending upon what they have available to them. And then communication. This is a really cool one. A lot of it's chemical, and I'll talk about it with bark beetles, that there's some really interesting communication that comes along with some insects. Some of you might be familiar with fireflies. Unfortunately, uh, west of the Mississippi, we don't really have fireflies, but we do have glowworms. Glowworms are amazing. So at the bottom left, this is a female glowworm. A glowworm is a beetle group. And the female has no wings, but the male does. And the female hangs out on vegetation or on the ground, and she flashes a signal that's specific to the species of male that she's trying to attract. Sometimes that's her species that she wants to mate with. Sometimes it's another species that she wants to lure in and eat. So they're clever. Um, so this is a really fascinating uh, strategy that they have in terms of communication. And other types of communication include vibration, drumming, um, just kind of tapping around. Like, um, chemical communication is a big one. And like I said, I'll get into that. So all of these evolutionary strategies, and um, this is why insects are found everywhere. All right, this is where it gets weird. I'm gonna let this just sink in for a minute. These are some weird insects. We have the honeypot ant at the top right that stores a whole lot of sweetness in its abdomen, and then the other ants feed from it. Um, scorpion fly in the top middle, that's a little weird looking, right? We have those in Oregon, actually. The middle right, stock-eyed fly, its eyeballs are extending from its head on stalks. What the heck? The next one is a fly whose head is full of eyeballs. I mean, these beasts are totally weird. And then this is just caterpillars. So because I'm an entomologist and a nerd, I love the caterpillars. They're crazy. They look so punk rock. And sometimes humans are really jealous and practice posmatic mimicry because these are just really impressive beasts. So. It's exciting to me. Hopefully it's exciting to you. All right. So I told you insects are everywhere. How many are there? We think that we have about a million species named. Um, we think there are 25 million plus out there yet to be named. Um, a lot of small ones, sometimes some larger ones we've actually found in recent years. Um, as you can see, Look at the top right. Beetles make up 22% of the named insect species. That's more than all of the other in, uh, plants and algae and other organisms. So we have more named beetle species than any other animal and plant species. 
That's really crazy. And if you think about the amount of ants we have, it was once said, which has been slightly disproven, but it's very close, that if you put on a scale all the ants in the world and then all the humans, ants would outweigh the humans. Now, because the way humans work, we have too many now. That is not true at this point in time. But we have a lot of insects. Some of them are below ground that we don't even see. So. What was that? Uh, good point. We may have gotten heavier. Sorry. Um, so we also have a lot of different services that we have from insects that are really important. Some of these you're familiar with, some of them maybe not. So in the food chain, they're really important as part of the food web. They eat and they are eaten, including by humans. Not by European countries, unfortunately, we haven't glommed onto the fact that these are full of good fats and protein and readily available, but that's coming soon. You can actually find some power bars that have ground up crickets in them, which is fantastic. Um, and they're natural enemies. They're really important to control other insects, especially when we talk about invasive insects or invasive plants. We use a lot of insects to control those pests. Decomposition and nutrient cycling. When I do talks for kids, I, I ask them, um, how do you guys feel about roadkill? Would you like to see roadkill just pile up on the side of the road, or would you like these beetles and wasps to take pieces of it away? Because it'd be a really stinky world if we didn't have these decomposers. And they cycle those nutrients right back into the environment. Everybody knows about pollination. That's a big one. Um, there are a lot of products that we get from the insects other than beeswax and honey. We get um, lac, so the lac insect. Shellac, that's where that came from. Um, we had certain dyes, cochineal insects produce a red dye that we use in lipstick and things like that. Um, really important creatures for, our, for humans as well. And yes, insects are pests. This is always the part that kind of bums me out that there are some that we are not supposed to like. I love them all the same, but some can be a little pesky. But I will say that for the most part, especially in the forest environment, these insects are only pests because we, or nature, creates the right conditions in which they can become pests. Those conditions are, we allow them to increase their numbers to a point that they can overcome plant defenses. A really good example are the population outbreaks of bark beetle. For you guys that answered what's like the major pest that's killed tons and tons of trees, that's the mountain pine beetle. It sweeps through a stand and it kills a ton of trees. Why does it do that? Because we have suppressed fire for so long long that the weak trees have not been taken out of the system as they naturally would have. So those beetles are doing that for us. Or we have stands that are unnaturally dense that we maybe haven't logged as frequently as we should have and replanted. And so these beetles do the job for us. So in a way, it's a good thing, but it's very devastating, especially when you're growing timber because it puts food on your table, or you're growing it because you like the aesthetics of having trees in your yard. It's devastating. If I lost my one Doug fir tree that I have in Portland, I would go ape. So I can understand these people that are losing their entire stand. Um, so a lack of natural enemies, that's a big one for invasives. I listened to a podcast the other day and people were talking about, I didn't realize invasives were such a big deal. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where have you been? Yes, invasives are huge because they come over from another place. They have no natural enemies. They don't have these things eating them, parasitizing them. They don't have the diseases they're used to. And so their populations explode and they can overcome our native systems and native species. Favorable conditions, so if we have mild winters, sometimes things like adelgids, those aphid-like things that attack conifers, their populations could explode because more of them live through the winter. And then the abundance of many susceptible hosts. All right, this is where I get on my drought platform. I have too many landowners still telling me, I've seen drought worse than this, this wasn't that bad. Yes, it was, yes it was. We have never had drought this extensive. We had three years in which each year was worse than the last year. Have we had dry years? Yes, we have. But have we had days in which the temperature extended longer throughout the day and the season? Not like that. Have we had precipitation that was not only reduced precipitation, but also precipitation not in the form that we needed it in? And what I mean by that is, when we get a little sprinkling here and there or a big washout, it doesn't allow us to recharge our storage of water. 
And so this is not the precip we need. We need snowpack. We need consistent rains. We can't just have these wash throughs. It does not store up to tide us through the rest of the year. So we had very intense drought. Don't kid yourselves. We will probably see it again. Plan for it. Plant native species in the appropriate place. If you have a, a tree stand, thin it properly. Talk to the, your stewardship forester because these trees, just because they've been around for a really long time, doesn't mean that they can withstand the things coming in the future. It's more intense that they have experience. So I'll get off that platform. I got really serious for a minute. If you want to know more about it, our Forest Health page has a drought fact sheet, and I'm more than happy to talk with you more about it. All right, so as I said, insects are often secondary pests. They just pick off the weak or the sick. Um, a lot of this is because these plants, they're really able to defend themselves. They have mechanical and chemical defenses, and it's very impressive when you look at all the different ways in which they can defend themselves or they can tolerate damage. But what their primary focus is on is growth. And so if they have resources such as water and nutrients, that goes to growth. Secondarily, it goes to defenses. And so they're growing and growing, and then if you have the right conditions, these insects are attacking and they have no defenses. So that's when they really get weakened. And these stressors, you know what these stressors are, but it's really good to keep this in mind when you're doing anything in your yard. It doesn't matter if you have a, you know, thousands of acres of a forest stand or if you just have your backyard. Be really mindful that you need to plant the right species in the right place. There's a reason that it grew there. If, you're, if you have a habitat in which your dug fur is struggling and you have oak coming up, what is that telling you? It's an oak pine habitat. Doug fir is not going to do well there. Take note of what should be growing there. Um, poor and inappropriate site quality. If you have a rocky site, realize that's a reduction of water availability. Um, be aware of current conditions such as drought, future conditions. There's competition if you have density in your plants. Um, and that competition includes grasses under your trees. When the rain comes down, the first thing that grabs that water are grasses, and they have an extensive root system. It doesn't even make it to the fine roots of the trees. So it looks like a little bit of grass, but that's heavy competition. Um, old age, low vigor, that happens. Um, mechanical injury, compaction. I've had more than one person riding their riding lawnmower over the roots of their trees, and they nick them, and they go, oh, they'll heal, it'll be fine. Well, it's an entrance point for fungus, and fungal spores are very tiny. Um, just the compaction of driving over them. I had one landowner that had a goat tied up to his tree that was rubbing up against a tree, rubbing the bark off, and he goes, I just don't know why my trees aren't doing well. I'm like, you keep tying your goats to your trees. <laughs> so just be mindful. They are, they're trees, they're resilient, they're strong, but they also need your support because they can be damaged easily as well. Um, fire, ice, wind damage, that's pretty obvious. And then there's always a complex. Rarely do I go into a stand and it's one thing that's happening. There's previous vertebrate damage, invertebrate damage, pathogen damage that's disrupting the function of the roots, the vascular tissues, what have you. So really, you kind of have to sleuth it out. So I'm going to really try and stick. There's so many insects. So I'm really going to try and stick to just some major groups that I get the most questions about. Um, we have the wood infesting insects. That includes the bark beetles. And when you have time later, um, I have some bark beetle uh, galleries that are really cool to look at, especially if you're kind of artsy fartsy because they're all different and really beautiful. Um, but these insects just go in and they hang out right underneath the bark. They don't get into the wood. But then we have the wood boring insects. That includes a lot of different groups. So it's the wood boring beetles, and there are also wasp and moth larvae that bore into the wood, um, and those are really important pests. And then we have the defoliators. They remove the leaf tissue or needle tissue. And then the sap sucking insects, they just remove the nutrients by sucking all the sap out of the needles. And we have others that focus on different areas such as just root feeding, um, terminal bud feeding, et cetera. But I'll try and stick to these major groups so we can get you guys home on time. All right, so bark beetles. This is, I wonder if one day I'll get sick of talking about bark beetles because they're just all the rage in forest health. Um, this is where chem chemical communication is really fascinating because what happens is these bark beetles can smell 
what host that they actually want to feed on. Sometimes they're very general in terms of I like all pine. Sometimes it's I only like ponderosa pine. So they pick up those chemical cues. They also pick up visual cues. If you have a very dense stand, they like to see that because that's a whole lot of vertical structures. Um, also, those smells get trapped in a dense stand. They don't move through with the wind current. And so if you have something very dense, it looks and smells fantastic. It's a salad bar and they come calling once an, a beetle comes in and goes, this is the host that I like, I'm gonna try and burrow in, the tree goes, no you don't, I'm gonna push you out with my tree sap. That tree sap is a mechanical barrier, it'll catch the insect, and it's also a chemical barrier because it has antifungal properties, as I'll explain, beetles travel with fungus, they're symbiotic, um, so it kills those fungi, fungi, and it also is a repellent to the insect, the insect doesn't really like it. But if the tree does not have enough sap or is just not able to contend with all the bark beetles that are hitting the tree, then that beetle can overcome the tree and it sends out a chemical signal, a pheromone to its similar species, the same species that says, come on in, the water's fine, let's attack this thing because power in numbers, we can overtake the defenses of this tree. Once they do that, males and females come in, they create their brood galleries, um, and then they realize, we've got enough in this co apartment complex, let's turn off this chemical signal, and they turn on a repellent signal, and that tells them, go elsewhere, no vacancy. And we've actually utilized that in that product, MCH, that we were talking about, one of the few products we have that's a great repellent, and it's only for Doug Fur Beetle and another beetle that we don't contend with here, but Doug Fur Beetle, it's a really useful product. So I'll show you, hopefully a little video will show up. So this is actually a Doug fur beetle wandering along in its gallery. It's like, why did you rip the roof off of my house? I'm just trying to get jiggy with a couple of females. But, all right, so like I said, bark beetles travel with stain. So this stain is a fungus. And the reason why it causes the stain is because it's the growth of the vegetated state of the fungus that clogs up the vascular tissue so they can't transport water and nutrients. To the left is blue stain, sap stain. It has a lot of different names. It's a fungal stain. There are several different species. It travels on the body of the bark beetles. It, it, it hangs out in these little um, crevices in the bark beetle's body and it's nourished. So it's this very symbiotic relationship. So it hangs out, it lives on their bodies. As soon as they crawl into the tree, the spores just kind of fall off into the wood. They start growing within the first couple weeks. And that stain right there probably only took a few months to travel across those annual rings. So that's a really definitive characteristic of blue stain or sap stain from bark beetles that it travels in rays across the annual rings. To the right, that's actually from a wood boring beetle. The beetle actually gets into the wood. That's ambrosia beetle. And you can tell the difference because one, it's black rather than bluish, but the fungal stains stay to the rings so they don't cross the rings. They just follow and grow along the annual rings. So um, the cool thing is, is it makes beautiful guitars and kitchen cabinetry and tables and it sells for high dollar, but usually that um, cost is not passed back to the grower. So a lot of growers of timber get deducted because nobody wants to buy a blue two by four, right? At Home Depot, they think it's rotten, but this fungal stain is actually not a rotting stain. It clogs the tissues, but it does not decay. So that's a point I really wanna get across. Don't be scared of the stain. This is not bad stuff. There are stains that are, but not this stuff. So how do you determine if you have bark beetles in your trees? So as I said, they bore in, they kick out this stuff called frass. It's a combination of their feces and the wood that they're chewing up and pushing through. So to the left, you can see those little orangish piles. It's orange because they only burrow into the bark. If it's a different color, as we'll see, they're boring into the wood. The lighter color, it's they're boring into the wood. Um, it, sometimes you'll have some streaming pitch in dug fur and true fur. Um, but in pines, you'll have pitch tubes. So the far right, that's a mountain pine beetle attack. There's a whole bunch of pitch tubes. And then the one with my finger right there, that's Ips. That's a really tiny pitch tube. You don't often see those. So sometimes, you, again, you have to sleuth it out in terms of does my tree currently have bark beetles or has it been recently attacked? 
Uh, oftentimes I get called out when the trees have already turned red or the beetles have already gone. So how do you determine if the beetles are still there? So once they come back out, there are exit holes. Bark beetles are the size of a grain of rice or smaller. So these are very tiny exit holes that you'll see scattered. It's just like shot right through the tree. So you'll see those exit holes. Once you see a bunch of those, the beetles have already used the tree. The tree is no good to them typically. And so you don't need to worry about sanitizing an area because the beetles are already gone. Look to the next tree. That's where they're gonna hit or they have already hit. Sometimes there's woodpecker damage. Um, some woodpeckers will flake off the outside bark because the bark beetles are right underneath the bark. If you see deep holes, they've, go they've gone after wood borers. Wood borers follow bark beetles. They're the decomposers. So if you see those deep holes, your tree is long gone. You already know that typically because it's already turned red. Sometimes it's just the very top of the tree and then the rest of it turns red, depending upon the insect species. Um, sometimes the whole tree turns red. Bark beetles typically will kill a tree within a year. Um, so if they don't kill it, the fungus will, but usually that takes a little bit longer. Our major bark beetles in Oregon that we contend with, and there are fact sheets about all of these in our Forest Health site, Doug fir beetle, and as I said, these galleries, these are super cool. They are totally different. So each species you can identify by the shape, size, pattern of their gallery. So we have Doug fir beetle to the top left. Fur engraver attacks true fur, that's the right. So if you see deep scores that are horizontal in a true fur, that's fur engraver. Once you've seen this, you can't unsee it. You're gonna start seeing this when you look at trees now. Um, mountain pine beetle is the bottom left. Western pine beetle, and mountain pine beetle attacks all of our pines. Western pine beetle attacks larger ponderosa pine typically, and they don't have a game plan. Their galleries are just like spaghetti. They're all over the board. So that's the bottom middle. Ips species bark beetles, um, those guys attack smaller diameter materials. So the top of the tree, the branches of the tree, smaller trees, so your pole size stands. Um, those are the bottom right. And those are kind of cool because they have an X or Y shaped gallery. So this one, the bottom right, is a Y shape. Why? Because the male burrowed in, created that center little blob, and called out to females, and three of them joined him, and each one made a leg. So there is a reasoning behind the madness. Real quick question, yeah. The galleries are right under the bark, and I have examples here. So if, if you see areas that have frass or uh, pitch streams or tubes, cut it out. Sometimes it's hard to peel it off, but if you peel it back, you'll see the, you'll see the gallery right behind the bark. Yeah. Only do that if your tree is really failing. Don't risk it on your good green tree. Um, okay, really quickly, I just want to go through two of the pests that um, we create these salad bars, as I mentioned, for because of natural conditions or human-caused conditions that create the right environment that these insects can really reproduce in and cause a problem. Doug fir beetle really likes blowdown. So the storms that we had in this area and around Eugene, Vanita, this last year and, and other areas, the large diameter Doug fir that fell down First, uh, the start of April, Doug fir beetles started hitting those trees. They develop in one year, then they attack the next standing trees the next April. But we have that product, MCH, that works great. It's really cheap. You staple it up in a grid-like pattern. It creates this cloud of stink that the insects go, I don't want to go in there. That doesn't smell good. And they'll retreat. And they'll either disperse on the landscape, making them not concentrated in certain areas, or some of them will simply die because they get tired of searching. They don't have a lot of fat stores. So if you have more questions about that, again, we have a fact sheet, or you can ask me. It's a really useful product. You can also use it for single tree. If you just have a big dug for you want to save on your property, just staple this stuff up. Works great. Yes, you can remove the blowdown. So I would remove it that first April to prevent them infesting or by the before the next April to prevent them from leaving the blowdown they already got into to hit the standing trees. And you can just mulch it uh, or chip it. You can just get it off site. Um, a lot of different methods. Yeah, real quick. MCH is broadly available. It's a general use pesticide. Um, it, you can just Google it. 
Uh, I can give you a list of distributors. It's really cheap. It costs 2 to $4 a pouch. You lay it out about 30 foot spacing grid. Um, you just staple it up on the tree. You can staple it on the down trees. Um, really readily available. And it's just based on the insect pheromone. So there's no non-targets and there's no risk to yourself. There's no carrier with it. That's a, that's a problem. Okay, really quick. I'm, I don't have a ton of time. Yes? We'll have to talk about that. Oh my gosh, arborvitae. Yeah, that's usually a site problem, that there's, they're not getting enough water, um, that some root damage, because they only have secondary pests that only attack them when they're really heavily stressed. They don't have something that's going to come in and kill them outright. But I'll talk to you more about that. That happens, yep. Avoid that if you can. Uh, one more? No, there are no effects of MCH on honeybees because this is a pheromone. It only speaks to its same species. It's not going to deter or attract honeybees into an area. Good question. All right, so bark beetle management. Preventative thinning is huge. Removal of stressed or damaged trees. Timely slash management. Not that guy. This stuff. Okay. Slash, Ips beetles really love slash. They get into it, they develop, unlike a lot of our other bark beetles that only develop in one year, or develop in one year, they actually have multiple generations, multiple broods per generation. They can develop egg to adult within two months. That's a really quick turnaround. And then once they use up the slash, they hit your standing trees. So anytime you are managing for pine, you need to be on top of your slash management. And there's a fact sheet on our website about timing and what you need to do with that, those materials. All right, so the wood infesting beetles, these are the ones that I get the calls about. So um, right here we have a prionus beetle that was in your quiz. It's a big beetle. That's my finger to the left, and that's a small one. So they get big, and they're, they're cool looking, though. Um, in fact, we got the idea of a chainsaw, uh, the chainsaw teeth layout from the larvae. Uh, the way that their mandibles cut through wood, you can actually hear them cutting into the wood. So the guy that invented the layout of the chainsaw teeth stole it from these guys. So, um, but these guys are secondary. These guys come in to decompose and return those nutrients back to the earth. So they are typically not a primary agent. Everybody finds these big flashy things and goes, that's what killed my tree. No, it's the really tiny things or it's the drought. Um, these guys are typically secondary and I'll talk about when they're not. So um, there are a lot of different types. Um, some of them have long antennae, some of them have short antennae, some of them are metallic, um, but usually they're a little bit larger. So in that top, the third picture in the top left, you see a larvae. It looks like a horseshoe nail. It's squished on the head. That's a flathead. That's a type of wood boring larvae. It's, it's a beetle. Right next to it, those little white things, that's a bark beetle larvae. So the little guys are the damaging ones. The big guy, not that damaging. It just comes in after the fact. Okay, really quick. Yes. Do they go inside of people? They do not go inside of people. Thank goodness, right? Um, we have other things that do that. Um, ambrosia beetles, that's another wood boring beetle. These guys are also very tiny, like bark beetles. Typically, they're secondary as well. They attack trees that are fire damaged, recently felled through uh, timber cutting. The reason why people freak out about these ones, though, is because they burrow into the wood and they cause damage. So you have a reduction of clear wood or usable wood for uh, timber or um, other purposes. So that's why those are typically a, a worry. They also do spread that stain that I mentioned. So you have that to the right there. How do you know if your tree was attacked by ambrosia beetle or bark beetle? Bark beetle has that reddish orange frash because it only goes through the bark. Ambrosia beetles get into the wood, so they kick out the white stuff. They're, that's a different color frass, and it's very obvious. It looks like powdered sugar just piled on the outside of the tree. So uh, these are the wood borers that we typically contend with that are actually more problematic. Bronze birch borer is a big one. The only reason why this one is a problem is because Br uh, birch is a riparian tree, right? It likes moisture, it likes shade, likes cool conditions, but we plant it in our uh, parking lots, we plant it in our front yard that gets full sun exposure, we plant exotic species, plant North American native 
birch in moist, cool areas and you won't have this problem. How you know if you have a bronze birch borer problem is the top starts thinning and then it moves on down the tree. Can you clip off that top and get rid of the insect? Maybe, but it's gonna come back because that tree is stressed, it's not in a good spot. Next, we have invasives such as emerald ash borer. I'm sure you've heard about that. Has not yet hit Oregon. Furthest west is Colorado that it's reached. We are assuming that it's going to get here soon. And so we are on the lookout for it. We have a program called Oregon Forest Pest Detectors to help you identify uh, ash that has been attacked by emerald ash borer and what this insect looks like. We always show these giant blown up pictures of insects and then you think they're like the size of my forearm. This is a very small insect. The hole that it makes right there, um, it's a D-shaped hole. That's a pencil at the left of that hole. So this is a very small insect. It's really hard to detect, unfortunately. But we are on the lookout for it. We have a statewide massive trapping system every year, unfortunately doesn't like to come to our traps. Uh, we don't have a pheromone attractant for it that's really successful. So we ask for people to give us a heads up if you see ash that looks bad. One more, yes. Yes. We're gonna have to talk about that because it could be a lot of things. There are like a million insects out there. All right, I got 10 minutes, I'm so sorry, but I gotta move on through this. We other wood infesting insects, these ones are not as big of a problem, sequoia pitch moth. If you see big blobs of sap on the outside of your pine trees, usually it's because you pruned at a time when the tree couldn't heal itself and that smells good to this insect, but it's just a cosmetic pest. It also attacks non-native pine, um, and I think it's a beautiful insect. It looks pretty neat. It's a um, yellow jacket mimic, so that's the adult right there. But just pull those soft globs off. Um, over time, it'll quit attacking your tree. It's really just cosmetic bad. Carpenter worm, not a lot of people deal with that, but in your hardwoods, you might have problems with that, about that, and if you have questions, let me know. Uh, defoliators, this is a pretty obvious one. You know if something's eating your leaves, right? Sometimes it leaves webbing, sometimes it leaves frass. Um, you don't always know what type of insect it is. A lot of our defoliators are cyclical, so they might have a big outbreak, but then it collapses. They're usually not a major problem, um, so we don't tend to worry about some of them as much. A caveat is the gypsy moth. So you may have heard about gypsy moth. Um, I did my grad work in the Midwest where they did calendar sprays for gypsy moth using BT. Um, we do not want that insect here. So if you have more questions about how to identify that insect, Oregon Forest Pest Detectors will show you what the um, egg masses look like, and they lay on everything. Somebody bought um, a vehicle on eBay, shipped it out from the East Coast. They found egg masses on the underside a little too late. That's where the insects came from. They will lay their eggs on anything. So we really are on the lookout. We do not want this to establish here. Um, we trap for this every year. Fortunately, we have a really excellent trap that they really love. So if they're in the area, they're gonna come to that trap. They love the smell of it. So we can detect them fairly readily. How do you get rid of them? BT is the best way. Um, BT is a great product. Um, it is a natural occurring soil bacteria that attacks, B, uh, there's BTK specifically. Unfortunately, it also attacks any sort of lepidoptera, so that's moth and butterfly larvae. So um, be judicious in using it. Uh, these guys hatch out really early in the season, so that's to our advantage when other things aren't awake yet. But the larvae eat it, essentially their stomachs explode. But it works really well, it breaks down really quickly, it's pretty cheap, um, it's, it's a pretty reasonable product, and most formulations of it are, are organic. Okay, sap-sucking insects. I don't have a lot of issues with these. Um, mainly, they're not, when their natural enemies are depressed because um, trees are growing in areas where there are a lot of agricultural sprays that depress those natural enemies, then these scale populations explode. These guys, they tend to be chronic in an area because they don't fly long distances. They just hang out. Um, so it makes them easier to treat, but that's one thing to look out for, especially if you see th thinning needles on your pine that have this like lion's tail uh, presentation where there are needles at the end of the branch but not inward. Um, you might look a little closer and see if you see these little black um, bodies. 
All right, so um, insects are also really essential in riparian stream habitats, macroinvertebrates. They're great indicators about the health of the stream in terms of how much dissolved oxygen is there, what temperature, what's the flow, what's the turbidity. If you find a whole lot of mosquitoes, you know that's a really stagnant water source because they have um, this siphon that they can get oxygen elsewhere. They don't need these cool, fast-running, oxygenated streams versus what's called the EPT species. This is, to the left, ephemeroptera, or mayflies, plecoptera, or stoneflies, trichoptera, or caddisflies, EPT. Those are essential for stream health. If you have a lot of those and you have diversity in the species of those, that's really great. Um, and I have a sample somewhere here. If you want to see how big these suckers get, it's pretty impressive. All right, pollinators. This is the last one because everybody has questions about pollinators. All right, so the, the uh, honeybee that we're all familiar with, is it native to Oregon? No, it's European. But we love it so much because we can harness its energy and its resources because we put it in these hives and it pollinates all of our European-based crops, right? It's fantastic. Let's also think about our native pollinators. Our native pollinators are essential. There are a lot of things that honeybees cannot pollinate for us, and we need these natives. They're really essential. What do we need to do to create better habitat? It doesn't really take much. Even if you do one of these things, it's really helpful. Although we're kind of behind the eight ball, these pollinators have been depressed for so long that we need to do a bit more than that. But if you can do even one of these on your property, it's great. Basically, don't make your property sterile. Leave some stuff that looks dirty to you. So leave nest building materials. That bottom left, there's an open pith of uh, rubus, so it's a raspberry or blackberry of some sort. They really, some of them really like those open pithy stems and they'll put an egg and pack some material and put another egg and pack some material and you've got a whole nursery in those stems. So that's really important. Uh, grow some of those plants, leave some mud, leave some wood materials. I leave piles of sticks in my yard. I have um, old bolts of wood from work that I just drill holes in, clean them out every now and then. These insects will utilize these materials. It's kind of like birds need nest making materials, so do bees. Um, nesting habitat, some of them like open ground. Bumblebees nest in the ground and they like a little bit of a clearing. They don't want grass everywhere. They like some open soil. Some of them like open sand areas. They like cavities or holes in wood because they don't make their own nest. They just utilize materials that are on site. They need diverse nectar sources. So you just plant one flower and that's good enough, right? No, some of them have different tongue lengths and so they might want a flower that has a really deep tube or a really short tube. Some of them only fly in the morning. So when that flower opens in the morning, that's ideal. So squash bees, they love it when your squash flower opens up first thing in the morning and they hit those. Later in the day, that's not really gonna help them. So you need to have a variety of different um, flowering times in the season, but also during the day. Also, um, the color spectrum. Save your red flowers for hummingbirds. These guys like the yellow to the blue spectrum. So think about those colors. Habitat corridors. So these insects, some of them are very small. They can't fly far. So they actually need um, these things to be connected. You can't just make one plot here and then another plot five miles away. They need corridors to travel through. And then timing and selection of pesticides. If you need to spray, spray at night when they're not flying. Spray something that's not broad spectrum. Spray things that aren't going to be sticking to the outside of the plant that are contact insecticides. Sometimes systemics don't make it to the pollen and the nectar, and those might be a better choice. So be really judici judicious about, do you really need to spray this thing right now? Be aware of that. All right, so um, my time is up. I just want to give you some resources. If you ever have questions, I'm a bug dork. I love to see what people find out there. Feel free to show me pictures or send me samples of things that you find that you're like, what the heck is this? There are also some ID clinics from OSU and ODA that have specialists that focus on certain groups and that can give you a very accurate ID. We have OSU extension agents. Hopefully the forestry stuff funnels down to me, so I will get it at some point. But we also have a lot of information online. ODF has a website, the o ODF Forest Health website. 
where we show our survey data. The four self-highlights report based on that survey data is at the table up front if you wanna take a look at that. Um, and we have all these fact sheets. Um, I'm not making them for myself, folks, so check them out. Um, Oregon forest pest detectors, if you wanna learn more about invasives. And if you have an invasive insect to report, the Oregon Invasive Species Hotline, we have all of our entomologists in the state look at it. I get these on Sunday afternoon and I look and go, oh, I wanna make sure it's not a gypsy moth. I will caution you, don't just send me a report that says I found some flies in my property. Give me a little bit more detail, maybe a picture. If you have a sample, fantastic, but at least a picture. A lot of things are native, you just haven't noticed them before, but we really wanna know if you find something that's out of the ordinary. That's really essential to us. You guys are our eyes and ears on the ground. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up, um, but I'm gonna open it up for questions, and thank you so much. Okay, yeah, in the, in the blue. Okay, question. The uh, PowerPoint is actually going to be on YouTube, so check it out. Stink bugs. Depends on which ones you're talking about. So we have the brown marmorated stink bug, which that's a big one. That's a major pest moving from the east to the west. Um, we're finding a lot of them. They are here. They're here in big numbers. What can you do? We don't have a whole lot of things to do about them other than soapy sprays. But if you have one that you want to know, I'm willing to bet if you're seeing a ton of them, it's brown marmorade stink bug. I've, as far as I know, stink bugs don't attack cats, but that, that's pretty odd. Yeah. Cat, <laughs> and there's a reason they're called stink bugs. They do stink, yeah. And we have a ton of them. They attack a lot of our crops. They're, a bit, they're one of the invasives that we know they're here, and now we're just trying to figure out how to fight them. Unfortunately... No, at this time we do not have biological controls. We um, basically, uh, they're probably going to establish here and be something that we're gonna contend with. The Oregon Department of Agriculture is working on those guys. Um, they just came in so fast and so furious and they hit so many different things, so. Next. Yes, yes, there are some good stink bugs in Oregon. We have a lot of natives, a lot of them are predators, and they're big predators, that they hit a lot of our pests in agricultural areas, so they're not all bad. The green shield stink bugs, you often see the green ones, those are actually pretty beneficial. So they're not all bad, yes. Yeah, definitely. So uh, the question was, what about encouraging um, insect-eating birds on the landscape? That's always great. If they're native birds that should be in that area, why not? I will caution, though, a lot of birds, they're not insect-specific, and so they will eat whatever's flying, um, even the things that aren't pests, um, but it's never a problem to have, you know, birds in your area. Yeah. Yes. That's a, okay, so there are these little white things, and I'm guessing, I, I hate to hazard a guess because there's so many insects out there, but we do have a lot of true bugs that have this like cottony, waxy stuff, and they're white, and they just look like cotton candy pieces, and they're tiny, floating in the air. Typically not damaging. They're just kind of an interesting thing. They're soft body. They don't live long. Um, I wouldn't be concerned with those. We do have some other insects. Some adelgids have those cottony bodies as well. If you see a cluster of those on a conifer tree, then you might want to worry a little bit, but we do have products to treat for those. Well, there's a, there are a ton. It's a true bug group, but there are a ton that have this like cottony white material that they exude. They're very tiny, yeah. Yes. Um, two questions. What do you think about the poor health impact of clear cutting of the landscape that converts native forests into tree farms? Mm -hmm.
Yes, so this is actually a really contentious topic. So let me address clear cuts first. So um, are clear cuts harmful? Yes and no. Because some situations, it's actually more beneficial to come in and do a clear cut rather than a selective harvest. Because if you think about it, you have repeated entry of uh, large equipment that compacts the root system. So it's better to come in and do the whole area rather than come in and just do a pocket here, do a pocket here, and then you have to make more roads and that's actually more damaging. So they try to assess it. Um, I'm not saying that it's always done the best way, but the Forest Practices Act in Oregon, although it could be better, couldn't all things, is one of the strongest in the nation in terms of, in terms of enforcement. In terms of enforcement, um, we do follow up. Everybody that does any sort of harvesting needs to file with the Oregon Department of Forestry. That's really essential. I'm not saying things don't slip through the cracks. It happens. Um, Exactly. Right. So I will tell you um, that we do have some riparian rules for stream buffers. They, that is also very contentious because we have uh, drummed up the data from our research that shows we do need to extend in certain areas, but that's not always up to the Oregon Department of Forestry. Talk to the industry, talk to the lobbyists, talk to your representatives. We are not the ones pushing forward the rules. We give you the data and then they take it and make those rules. So you need to talk to them about getting those and you need to continue to talk to them about making those changes. Sure, well, yeah, money does drive things. So your second, so the helicopter sprays. So um, the helicopter sprays, that is an essential portion of replanting because you're spending all this time and money for resources. You want these trees to be able to be free to grow, which means that they aren't covered by weeds. Unfortunately, we have a lot of invasives like scotch broom and blackberry that grow very quickly. In the first three years of that seedling's life, it is really essential to spray so that you can beat it down. If we had a million people and a million bucks, we could go out there and hand pull everything, but we don't. And so this has been determined to be the mo most efficacious way to do it. Are there better ways to do a lot of things? Yes, there are. But this is the way, this is the way that we have done this. We have a cancer epidemic from a lot of things, unfortunately. Sure. This, I, I, would, I would like to continue answering this question. So sprays are a part of a replanting process. So um, may I ask you, do you live in a home that's made of wood? Do you live in a home that's made of wood? The issue is we do need wood products. There are better ways to do things. We do work on this. And we do want your input. We do want your input because your input is valuable in terms of making these things kind of go the direction we want them to. What I'm saying is Oregon Department of Forestry does not make rules. We do not make the laws. That's up to the Board of Forestry. That's up to what goes on in the legislature. All we can do is take down the data and give them our information. And so you really need to talk to lobbyists, you need to talk to your representative. I know you've done that, you need to continue doing that. Fight the good fight. That's all I, that's all I got for you. That's all I got for you. That's all I got for you, unfortunately. I'm one person, I can't do it. So, all right, I don't know how many more questions we have. I'll take two more, Red. That's a good question. The question was, can you get a hive from local pollinators? You can always um, get a honeybee hive, but the native pollinators, you're kind of on your own for that. Fortunately, there are a wealth of resources. Look on the Xerces website, that's X-E-R-C-E-S. They do a lot of good work. It's a nonprofit. They're um, based out of Portland, but they're actually nationwide. They have a lot of good materials on establishing and maintaining natural pollinator, native pollinators in natural settings in your property. It could be as simple as just buying some tubes with some bees in them and having those on your property. You do need to do a little bit of maintenance, but I'll tell you what, native pollinators, a lot easier to maintain than honeybees. So go for it. All right. Oh, yes. Okay, I just want to take two more. All right, in the pink. So silviculture in this, in this community, is it Southern Oregon, actually Western Oregon, is it under threat from the Bureau of Land Management? 
Yes. Okay, that's a big question, but I'll try and answer it succinctly. Okay, so what are we doing about moving forward with how we attack silviculture, what species we plant, how we plant them, because we are in changing times, climate-wise and otherwise. Um, so a really big part of that is monoculture. We know that monocultures are never good. I will tell you, when you see all these dug first stands, there are other species in there they're also harvesting, such as alder. We just don't see them as predominantly. The message that is always being sent out from Forest Health, our program, is that you want to vary the canopy, so vary the ages if you can, vary the species if you can. Sometimes that's not the most efficacious way to do it financially, and so that's what drives a lot of things, unfortunately. There's a very big difference between industry and then the private landowner in terms of what they want to grow. I will tell you things like Christmas tree farms are the biggest pain in my side because you have these Christmas tree farms in which it's a bunch of grand fur that typically don't do well in the valley anyway, and they're just left to grow, and they're treated with tons and tons of pesticides, and not much else is done for their health, and that's really difficult. All we can do is give people the information and say, look, this is what makes a healthy tree. This is what makes a healthy stand. It's up to you as long as you don't break any laws about how you do it, but we are gonna monitor and we're gonna give you that information. We cannot control what you do. This is your property. Unless you're breaking some laws, unless you're doing some mass damage, we can't control that, but we can give you as much information as we have about how best to manage your stand to make sure these trees are healthy. The message I try to send is, look, if you make your trees healthy, they won't be attacked by insects. Oftentimes, they won't be attacked by disease, or at least they won't die from these things. So focus on the tree health. Climate change is huge. We are pushing that. That is really big. That should have been in our mouths 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, the message we're sending is, be aware of what species you're planting where and look towards the future that this is not the last of our drought cycles. We will, we will have more. Will they be as intense? We don't know, but we will have more planned for that. And so you ask the question about pine. We're not introducing pine species that weren't here before. Willamette Valley pine, which is the west side variety of ponderosa pine, has been here. It's just not been a common plant to grow because it doesn't um, bring in a lot of money. Um, but it is a very important plant, and we're trying to push that more that go to the oak pine habitat in areas where dug fir is failing. So I don't know if that fully answered your question. We can't solve all problems, but we're sure trying to at least give the information so that landowners and industrial owners are really trying to make the right decisions. But we cannot control what everybody does. Okay, I have one more. Yeah, I, your hand's been up. I'll answer your question at the end if that's okay. Yes. It depends on the size of the, uh, the question was, um, there's some dead trees along Highway 126, are there commercial value to those trees? It depends on how many trees you have, the diameter of those trees, the taper of those trees, are a lot of different qualities. Sometimes we use things for biofuel, sometimes we use things and just make chip um, for biomass, but um, yeah, there are a lot of times when unfortunately trees are not commercially viable. Some of those in particular, that's actually some national forest land. And so it's, um, 
the Forest Service has their own way of doing things, and um, sometimes they would prefer to just let those uh, fall down and become wildlife trees. That's not commercially viable to them to go and collect those trees. So that's what you might see happening. They will remove some of them that are along scenic corridors that block view from live trees or that could be a fall hazard on cars. Um, but the Forest Service generally is trying to create a more natural setting for better or for worse, because it's also suppressing fire and things like that that are natural, but um, it, it really depends on the ownership and the quality of the trees if they are commercially viable. So, and I'll grab your question at the end, um, but I think we're done here, so. All right, thank you.